I was living in Oakland when Master P had them yeah. them posters up mm -hmm. with the ghettos trying to kill me. And it was like, like a slightly like a R-rated kind of photo. It had like a girl kind of naked on top of him, like a dude with a gun in the background. Oh, yeah. And, the ghettos know. trying to kill me. Right. That's that exactly. way. Yeah, you now, go were you actually living... In Oakland at the time when Master P was coming up, or did you guys, you know, were you in a different area? No, I was there. I was there. I mean, I've been there for, man, as long as I can remember. I, before there even was a No Limit, I've been there. So, yeah, from day one. From day one. Okay. So, I remember I got into a conversation with, with a guy from the Bay, because mm -hmm. I come from the Bay as well. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, how did No Limit blow up mm -hmm. when all these other independent record labels in the Bay were hustling and doing kind of the same thing with, you know, different type of talent level, but Master P and No Limit got to a bigger place than everyone else. And he told me something interesting. He said that, that the No Limit guys were the only ones who just kept working. Mm. Like, yeah. he said that y'all would go through the hood and just give out t-shirts like every day, and almost to the point where you, you got, you know, Y'all became the t-shirt dudes. Like, oh, yeah, man, the t-shirt dudes coming through. And, yeah. You know, y'all would do these in-stores and no one would show up, but y'all continue to keep doing in-stores and so forth yeah. and so forth. And he said the work level that y'all had was just on a different caliber than everybody else. Yeah. Now, is that accurate or, or is it not? Well, honestly, you, could, you couldn't say it any better. Um, I think, you know, at the time, they looked at us as talent-wise, was like, oh, they okay, but... You know, it's just a firm belief that hard work pays off. So when people were asleep, we was working. Uh, we'd be in, we'd be in the ghetto, the hood. We'd be everywhere we can go at. They can, they listen to us. We was there, free concerts, free shows. I mean, we just outworked everybody. And and of course, it wasn't a really a movement for the South, but uh, by us just keep on grinding and you know turn it around. I mean, I, I think my thing is if you if you outwork the next person. You gonna eventually get your just due, and that's just what we felt. We felt like, okay, at the beginning, nobody wanted to hear it, but eventually, you know, they gotta come see us. What do you think were like the toughest times during that time? Like, you know, because we talked about how, you know, you guys would have shows and no one would show up, or you guys would have in stores and no one would show up, but you know, you kept at it. Well, what do you think was the toughest time during that era? I would say. Um, it was the grind because we, w we wasn't seeing nothing at first. And, you know, it's stuff like bills piling up and you taking out, you know, you really going and putting everything into it. And then people like, oh, you're not going to make it. So that was the tough times. And then I think the most tough time was, was when um, we got a little buzz and I think we was going to a label and uh, we start going to labels and labels looking at us, whatever. And they offering us money, but we don't have money. So we like... Should we take this deal? It was tough for us to say, take the deal or, you know, get some money, take the deal and, you know, pay our bills and live a little better for a little while. But we went back to the street, turned the deal down, went back to the street and doing that, that would sometimes have you second guessing yourself like, man, did I do the right thing? So that transition part was really tough for us because um, we, we turned down a deal that could have put food on our table made it a little bit better for us, um, but it ended up working out in our favor because we believed in what we was doing. So who was the deal with, do you remember? Um, I think the first offer was, I want to say Priority. Um, it was a couple, a couple other labels that was trying to give us some deals. Um, I think we turned Priority down the first time, and then it came back the second time with, you know, with a better, better offer after we put work in, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So leading up to this time, you know, leading up to the, the bigger deal and the money and everything else like that, like how deep were you in the streets? <laughs> wow. That's, um, streets was, I mean, that's what, that's what we got, you know, that's what we made it happen at. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, what we, you know, what the past is, but, you know, we hustled, we made, you know, made stuff happen. Um, and we was deep in it because we were trying to get out of it. So, the, the, it seemed like the further you try to get out of it, the deeper you go into it. Um, so we had a vision, we had a dream, we had to put all our talents, and uh, and just it just kind of you know leave the streets alone at some point. But you know the streets was our way out at first. Well, you lost one of your brothers to the streets. Yeah, that and that changed it all. I think I think um, it's kind of you know it's kind of sad, but but you know it's a happy moment as well because I don't think we would have made it if. 
if he wouldn't have passed away. Um, I think the way he passed away, um, it made us say like, wow, okay, it's, it's four of us and now it's only three of us. And the hood, the streets did that, you know what I'm saying? And so it made us like, wow, this could really happen to us. So we didn't want to lose another brother. Um, so we just kind of like, you know, we, we, we bared down and was like, let's get out of here once and for all. What was the situation around your brother passing? Uh, I think it was it was a friend that he didn't really totally like. Um, and, you know, I, I think, um, you know, just being young, don't know any better. I think um, he just looked at it like, oh, okay, well, you know, he don't like me, but, you know, we all good. Ain't nobody gonna, he didn't think he gonna lose his life, but, you know, they took him for a ride. Uh, the guy he didn't like sat in the back seat and basically, they, you know, they shot him in the back of the head like four times. Wow. That's sad, man. Yeah. What, what happened to the guys who were, who were involved in that murder? Um, you know, typical stuff in New Orleans. Like, they got a couple, one of them didn't really do much time. The other one got like maybe eight years, but got out, you know, early. Um, so, you know, it, it's sad to watch, you know, but, you know, everybody got to get their judgment. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll play that, you know, play it like, play like that. Well, how, how does someone commit a murder and only get like eight years? That doesn't make any sense, especially in the South where they, they give out football numbers. Well, in the South, they give you the football numbers, but if you're killing each other, that's, that's, they don't give those numbers out like that. They, are, they, almost, they almost give you a number where they want you to get back out and do it again type of number. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's deep. I mean, that, that's really crazy when you say it like that. So these guys who, who did that are still out and about? Um, I think one of them may have passed away. Um, I guess karma, maybe. I don't know. Um, I think the other one is... The other one, I think, it's really funny. I think he's, he's out, but he's doing something good with his life. So, I, you know, I don't, I, look, I let God handle that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I let that up to God. Um, I can't judge nobody why they did it or whatever. I don't really hold remorse. Um, you know, but one of them lost his life. The other one is a really outspoken person who's trying to change people's lives. So, you know, I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. <laughs> so if you actually ran into the one who, who's actually trying to change his life, like, what would that conversation be like? Hmm. I think originally it would have been, been all bad, but um, I think now how I operate in life, um, you know, we, we could probably figure it out, talk about it, um, you know, see where he at, make sure he's in the right place. And if he is, I mean, I, look, I forgive him. Um, never forget it, but definitely forgive him for it. Um, especially if somebody changing their life. I mean, people deserve a second chance. As bad as it is to kill my brother, that's, that's I don't think he should deserve it, but then what I, who I'll be to, to, to not offer somebody who really, you know, um, change a second chance. You think that a PNC murder feel the same way? Mm, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, mm, probably not so much. Probably not so much. Uh, I know Jaden a little bit. You know, we run into each other in Calabasas. That's cute. Uh, he can date all the he, white He was wearing a dress last time. Last time I seen was him. Yeah, he was wearing a dress last time I seen him. Okay. Does, uh, he, wear, does he come down to Crenshaw with one on? I don't think he goes to Crenshaw, period. I don't think. I, oh, he might slip down there, but he ain't got no goddamn skirt on when he comes down there. I bet you that. Speak up for the black community on the main stage. Because she don't got to do that. Beyonce's rich. Beyonce's not black or white. She's Beyonce. All right? <laughs> She's not man or woman. She's Beyonce. She's reached that level like Oprah. Like, Oprah's just an entity. That's what Beyonce is. So Beyonce don't have to speak up for us. 